Okay. Hey, everyone. This is Catch My Drift. I'm Jake Steinberg, and I am a political person. Um, If you've followed me for any amount of time, this is no shock to you. You already know this. And I wanted to spend today's video talking about one of the most common comments I have received when making videos and just being online in general. It's an idea that I'm sure you've seen if you've spent any time online at all. And that comment is, keep politics out of games. I find this request, this idea that politics can be kept out of games at all, to be a bit absurd and I think inherently flawed, and I think what it comes down to is people misunderstanding what exactly politics are and how they function in our society. So today, I want to explain why I think it is impossible to keep politics out of video games, and I hope that by the end of this video, you understand how politics permeates art and culture in a way that is unavoidable. To break this down, I think we first need to answer, what are people asking for when they request that politics be kept out of games? What is an unpolitical video game? So when someone flags an idea or character as political, they are, I think, identifying that element as creating friction with the status quo. They are identifying something that is different from the norm. Now, most often when I come across this idea of keeping politics out of games, it is attached to historically oppressed identities, whether that be being black, a person of color, or queer. The inclusion of a black character, or like a pride flag, is seen as encroaching upon a version of the game that is free from the political influence of these elements. The imagined, non-political version of this game features white people and straight people not these elements. But that imagined game, a game that this person would identify as not being political, is actually just as political. Consider this idea. All art exists on a spectrum, ranging from reinforcing the status quo to subverting it. Every piece of art takes a position on this spectrum, reflecting and influencing the politics of its era. A game that features largely familiar or typical depictions of heroes and gender roles is political its politics are just aligned with the status quo. Upholding institutional power is just as political of an act as subverting it. Now, some, in a desperate attempt to prove that some games can truly be removed entirely from politics, may point to games like Mario or Pokemon, but I would argue that these titles, in things like their character designs, gender roles, the broad themes that are reflective of collective values, are just as politically shaped. Similarly, something like Smash Brothers, one could say is political in a meta way when you interrogate who is prioritized with a spot on the roster. On that specific point, many would say, oh, you're just, that's a criticism of gaming as a whole. That's not about Smash Brothers, but games like Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2, very similar position, show how easy it is just to subvert the norm, subvert expectations and practice inclusion. So the question isn't whether a game is political or not, the question is whether a game is adhering to social and political norms or creating friction against them. Now, part of this argument I'm making heavily leans on this idea of seeing straight white people as the norm, as the status quo. And in case you can't tell, this is not like my take on society. This is an oft written about phenomenon typically referred to as white as default. You could do a whole video on this, you could do a bunch of reading on it, but broadly the idea is to default to whiteness as the norm against which other racial or ethnic identities are judged or compared. This happens because white characters are often overrepresented or portrayed in leading roles in media, while characters from ethnic minority groups are relegated to supporting roles. This overrepresentation of whiteness creates the impression that white experiences, that white perspectives and white identities are the norm, while those of other groups are seen as deviations from that. And again, especially in video games, you do not have to take my word for it. 
In 2021, a study determined that 80% of video game characters are male, 54% are white, and only 8.3% of main characters in games are females of non-white ethnicities. So these gamers are in a sea of content that features an over-representation of white men. They center that perspective, they get used to it, and think that any deviation from that experience is because somebody must be forcing a political perspective. And I know this is how people think because last week I made a video about the ongoing harassment campaign against Sweet Baby Inc. and the Steam Group that was set up to identify games in which they could feel the presence of forced diversity from that narrative consulting company. Now, via Wired, the person who started that Steam group said in an interview on YouTube that his interest in all of this started with God of War Ragnarok because he, and this is the quote, noticed things were different. And looking at other games, he claimed to start noticing a pattern. Now, what was different, okay? He said that he started to identify woke products and virtue signaling. So what's going on here is that he is identifying the presence of non-white identities as politics. He is rejecting art that subverts the status quo in video games. And when he sees these identities, he says, that's virtue signaling, that's woke, that's political. In closing, always be suspicious of people claiming that there is some kind of cabal or agenda against uh, or behind culture and art changing and evolving. Uh, you can really extend this logic to anything that people get unreasonably upset about, I think. Uh, language, for instance, is constantly changing and evolving, and yet people constantly throw fits over having to learn what they think like the latest politically correct, you know, term is. Uh, but I would say that these are not bugs. These are features. We should be changing and evolving and becoming more intelligent, specific, and inclusive. People rallying against these things are oftentimes just so attached to a system that centers and benefits themselves that they cannot imagine becoming a whole, more complete person by embracing perspectives outside of their own. Slightly related to today's episode with this whole uh, Sweet Baby Ink saga that's still going on, I've seen a lot of discourse surrounding the idea that you can or cannot be racist against white people. And I want to talk about this here just because I think it's important. Um, a lot of people seem to think that racism is an action, but it's not, right? It's You don't do a racism. Racism is a systemic ideology that perpetuates inequality and discrimination. And I think that's a definition that most people would agree with. Uh, so when people say you can't be racist against white people, they are saying that you can't take advantage of an existing system of power to oppress people. Uh, calling somebody a cracker or, or treating somebody differently because they are white is not racist in the same way that actual racism is because there is no attached system or po of power or support empowering that person committing those acts. It's just uh, somebody being mean. There's nothing behind it, you know what I mean? It's just somebody being mean. And I think a lot of white people have never truly been made a target, okay? So they can't imagine, with this kind of power behind them, as though they can't imagine uh, what it's like, and they don't practice empathy with others. Uh, so anyways, I don't know. I just wanted to get this out there because I see a lot of people rallying for and against this idea, this you can or cannot be racist against white people, but there's not a lot of people explaining it, it, actually like why they believe that. So I just wanted to put this out there in case anybody's seen that discourse and said, but nobody's, nobody's like spelling it out or whatever. And that's nobody's job, but uh, I thought I would do it here. So with that, I hope you catch my drift and um, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.